members of the Women's League, women ministers, shocked, outraged at what these young women were doing. And then becoming concerned with their political persuasion. Oh, perhaps it's because they're EFF or becoming involved with other aspects, referring to them as young girls. They were all clearly young women. They were clearly of different political persuasions, but I think they spoke for all women in bringing to the forefront the issue of violence against women and the fact that one in three women are raped in South Africa. If you look around this auditorium, and you think about one in three, I think that's pretty much of a wake-up call. And I don't think there's any wrong time to begin to talk about and to draw attention to such issues. I've also been thinking about Woman's Day, and I'm sure some of you were looking forward to having the day off, and instead you were told you were coming to the Apartheid Museum to listen to people like us talking about women's issues. But I wonder if it really serves any, any valuable purpose. Um, I mean, I think I was watching the television before I left and looking at the, at the rally outside the Union buildings, it was so starkly different from that rally 60 years ago. It was large numbers of very well secured, they don't want any more young women jumping up, women, mainly black, Many bust in from all over South Africa, and they were all acting as an imbongi for our president. It was mainly singing praises to the president, and nobody dared to say anything else. And what really interested me was that Ma Sophie de Brain, Mum Sophie de Brain, many of you will know her, spoke on the radio this morning very movingly about the four women, and this afternoon at the union buildings, didn't say a word about it, spoke about other things, but not about that. So there seems to be some sort of culture of fear about speaking out, some sort of concern, not for Sophie de Brain, I'm sure, but for some people it's about patriarchy, obviously, how dare you do that to the president, who for me symbolizes patriarchy in South Africa. And then for others it would be about you know, maybe having less, maybe not getting one's hands in the coffers quite so adequately if one speaks out. But just briefly to talk a little bit about the, the area where I work mainly, which is in corporate South Africa with businessmen and women, and also in the higher education institutions of South Africa. I think it's really tragic that today only 20% of boards of South Africa are made up of women. We make up 51% of the population. And if you look at the positions women occupy in, in corporates, only 4%, 4% of women are CEOs of large organizations, or small organizations for that matter. And 24% of women hold management positions. So I think we've got a lot of work to do in terms of corporate South Africa. And this is in spite of a mass of research showing that more diversity you can bring into organizations, whether it be gender diversity, racial diversity, people with disabilities, all kinds of diversity, that impacts the bottom line in an extremely positive way. It makes companies earn more, to put it simply, and yet still, we don't see nearly enough women um, represented on those boards. Um, <clears throat> there's been various acts promulgated by the government very positively to Employment Equity Act, Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act. But in spite of that, 18 years after the Employment Equity Act has been passed, still white men make up the vast majority, I think it's 89% of the top management of organizations. Um, in terms of salaries, we also see that in the private sector, women doing the same work as men earn between 15 and 17% less than men. And what that means is that women would have to work an extra two months every year to catch up with men doing the same job. 
And it's not only the numbers, it's also the physical environment in the workplace that often acts against the progress of women. Most workplaces don't have a place, for example, for women who are breastfeeding or who need to express milk to go privately and do so in decent surroundings. Women tell me they have to go to the toilet to do that or they have to go in their car. And yet breastfeeding is a fundamental normal thing that most women have to do at some part of their lives. Many corporate environments don't provide sanitary wear for their employees. And I think all of us as girls and women know that we don't always know exactly when our periods are going to arrive. So there's an awful lot to do. And then there's also the unconscious bias that happens in workplaces. The kind of assumptions people make about you because you're a woman. And when some of you have gone through tertiary or gone through college or just moved into the workplace, you're going to be hearing things like, oh, she's so young, we can't employ her. She's just going to get married and have children. Or we can't employ her, how is she going to travel to work? Or look at her, she's wearing a hijab. Her husband probably won't even allow her to work. And all of these are assumptions based on unconscious biases that people have that stand in the way of women. So I think there's a lot that we can do in the business space. We can, well, we can talk a little bit about that perhaps later, Eusebius. But just mainly to end then, because I think our other, other people also have a lot to say, that um, there was a, a, quite a famous woman who was the first black woman to become a parliamentarian in Canada. And what she says, I think, says it all. She says, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it. So we need solidarity. Thank you. Thank you.